to this sermon on a selfie stick. Uh, sermon by the seaside or the bayside, rather cold and wintry morning it is too. Our reading today, this being the second Sunday in the season of Epiphany, is from John's Gospel, chapter 1 and from verse 43. The reading is taken from John 1, verses 43 to the end. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe, because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if you can remember that first Alan Partridge series. I'm Alan Partridge. Aha! And it was groundbreaking comedy. It created a kind of genre, I think. A genre which married laugh out loud laughter with a kind of horrible, cringing feeling, awkwardness at the same time. It was rather like laughing and dragging in nails down a a chalkboard, those you remember, blackboards. But it's not that I want to talk about. It's the aha bit. I wonder if you can remember how many aha moments you've had across your life. And what I mean by aha is that, that moment when you saw something for the first time or realized something for the first time, and in such a way that it changed you, it changed the way you looked at yourself, the world. And aha moments can be joyous, wondrous occasions of hope and faith and love. Sometimes they're quite dark things. I'll give you an example of a, a dark aha moment. I was about six when this happened and along with my parents we'd gone to stay in someone's house. And the bedroom I had was kind of tucked away and it was windowless so it was very dark at night. I went to bed and as has been common throughout my life, I just couldn't sleep. And I lay there with my mind churning over whatever it was churning about. And at some point or another, as I lay there, I suddenly became aware of infinity. I became aware of this universe of planets and galaxies and worlds that stretched on and on and on. And it, this wasn't an abstract thought. It, I, I kind of felt it. And at the same time as I felt that, I felt how small I was and finite and how little. And that whereas this universe would go on and on and on and was largely empty, I would be unknown and small. And I was so upset by this and so overwhelmed by it that I, I just ran downstairs to my parents and crying and they reassured me and uh, I went back to bed and I slept after that but that was an aha moment when I realized that beyond this six-year-old little boy was a, a not just a world but a reality a universe that was way beyond my comprehension well that's an aha moment this season of Epiphany in which we're in, it stretches from, I guess, the end of Christmas uh, right through to the beginning of Lent. It's quite a big season, actually. 
it starts with, in our calendar, in the West, the Western Church, if you like, with the journey of the Magi to Bethlehem. These Gentiles who follow the star and have their eyes opened to see God in the face of this baby Jesus. And it goes through lots of other stories, some of them well known, some of them not so well known. It'll take in the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. It'll take in uh, the presentation of Christ in the temple that's coming up uh, in a few weeks' time when the old man Simeon has his eyes opened. It takes in this story today, one of the lesser known stories really. It's a kind of random encounter between a man called Nathaniel of whom this is the only mention in all of the New Testament here in John chapter 1. It'll take in the transfiguration of Jesus, a really famous story, in a few weeks' time. But it's this story today uh, on which we're going to focus our attention, the story of Nathaniel meeting Jesus for the first time. And this turns out to be an aha moment. And by the way, the word epiphany, it's a funny word, it's an old word, a mysterious word, and it's meant to be mysterious because it tries to encapsulate or describe a mystery. It means literally to see or to reveal uh, an appearance. Something happens that means you see it. It's a manifestation when the penny drops and you realize what's happening. And these epiphany stories, in fact, this season of epiphany in the New Testament, uh, really is about uh, seeing God for the first time, a revelation of God, particularly in the face of Jesus or uniquely in the face of Jesus. That's what an epiphany is. It isn't so much about the penny dropping generally, abstractly, about stuff in life, although that's important. But the season of epiphany is about seeing God, God revealing himself, mysteriously, sometimes fleetingly, in the person of Jesus and the impact that has on the people around him. Well, let's look at this story, this story of Nathaniel. It starts at the, right at the beginning of John's Gospel. And it's an odd story because Jesus appears, he's announced by John the Baptist, and then Jesus goes about his life, his business, and we come across someone called Andrew. And then Andrew gets his brother Simon, whom then Jesus says, your name is not going to be Simon anymore, it's going to be Peter, Kephas. And then someone called Philip is found by Jesus. Now, if you saw that, Jesus finds Philip. Philip then goes to his friend Nathaniel, and he says, we found Jesus, even though it's Jesus who found Philip. Philip says, we found Jesus. And more than that, he says, he is the promised one. All the law and the prophets, Moses, have been pointing to this. Now, that's quite a claim to make, because he's only just met Jesus. He's come out of nowhere as Jesus, but Philip makes this bold assertion. And Nathaniel says to Philip, really? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth. That place is just full of, well, it's an anonymous place, but it sits in Galilee and it's just full of insurrectionists and revolutionaries and hotheads. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? We've heard, heard that word insurrection used a great deal, haven't we, in the last few weeks, last week. That demonstration, riot, whatever it was on Capitol Hill in the build-up to the inauguration of Joe Biden when President Trump kind of marshaled his supporters to stop the steal, as he called it, and they marched on Capitol Hill. And they've been accused by lots of American commentators and news pundits of being insurrectionists. Some have called them domestic terrorists. Well, that's what Nat, that's how Nat refers to Jesus there. Nazareth? It's just full of hotheads. People who are just uh, full of hot air. Well, Jesus comes along. And before Nat can say anything else, Jesus says something to him. Nat, I, I, I saw you. I saw you and knew you before you saw me. I, I saw you when you were sitting under a fig tree. 
And that says what? What do you mean you saw me? You knew me. And then Jesus says, yeah, you're, you're, you're an Israelite. You're a true Israelite. You're a, you're a true man. You're a real person. You're authentic. There's no guile in you. You, you just call it as it is. You say it as it is. You're real, Matt. I really like you. And you can feel this kind of, wow, it's an aha moment from Nat because he's been found. This special one, this man from Nazareth has found him. And he says, you are, you're the king of Israel. You're the son of God. I mean, what's going on here? A, a few moments ago, Nat said, I'm not going to be taken in from some hothead from Nazareth. A few minutes later, he's saying, you're the king of Israel. You're the son of God. What's happened here? What is a hard moment? Well, it's very personal. Nat feels he's been found. God has found him. God has met him. God has seen him. God has held him. God has loved him. God has drawn close to him. And that's all he can do with this, this kind of shout of praise. You can almost feel it. You're the one. You're the king of Israel. You're the son of God. I'm going to follow you. You've asked me to follow you. I'm yours. I'm following you. It's an aha moment. I wonder if that's been our experience of God that kind of encounter where I've been found, I've been seen, I've been discovered, and I'm part of something much bigger than just me on my own, going about my life. I'm not part of God's people. I'm part of his kingdom. I'm part of his project to transform the world, transform the heavens. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I'm mindful of uh, a, a Jewish philosopher called Martin Buber, who many, many decades ago uh, write, wrote a book uh, called I Thou. And he describes meaningful encounters between God and humanity, between people and each other. You know that experience where you're found, I Thou, of immediacy, of reality, when you found somebody, somebody finds you, and it's life-changing. It can be love. It can be an ongoing relationship. It can be something that changes you. It reminds me of that film, Good Will Hunting, with Matt Damon and Robin Williams, where Matt Damon plays this janitor, Will Hunting. And he's a, it turns out he's a brilliant mathematician, but he's also delinquent. He's wild. He's violent because he's had a terrible past. And Robin William plays this therapist, his therapist. Uh, I think it's John, Dr. Sean Marguerite. And in the course of a, a tempestuous therapeutic relationship, there comes a moment where Dr. Sean and Will really meet. And it's life changing because Will Hunting changes. He realizes he's been found, he's loved. And despite his wildness and his tempestuousness, he has meaning as a human being. He has real value. He's loved and his life changes. That's an epiphany. I can think of my own life, just one story. I was 22. Or was I 21? I can't remember. I'd done a law degree. I was in London. I was hangover. Some of you know this story. I was in Streatham Common. I was far away from God. It was a Saturday evening and it was uh, kind of early springtime, that lovely kind of weather when they're long evenings and the air is warm and it wasn't raining. And I was on my own, kind of just walking around this common, brooding, but introspective, as I said, hungover. And out of nowhere came this voice. Was it the voice of God? Well, I don't know. It was certainly a voice inside me. And the voice said this. Is this what you're going to amount to, Gethin? Is this you? Is this going to be the rest of your life? 
And I was shaken. Whoever it was that was speaking to me shook me to the core because I thought, I'm grubby. I'm going nowhere with my life. I, don't, I wasn't enjoying my law studies. I felt and I was hangover. And that wasn't uncommon for me at that point in my life. That was happening an awful lot. And this voice really brought me up sharp. It was an aha moment. Next day was Sunday, I went to church. And amongst other things, I cleaned my life up. I went back to God. I gave my life back to Jesus Christ. It was a Sunday morning. I did something I had never done before. There was a, a call for recommitment. I went forward, I felt incredibly self-conscious and embarrassed. But I thought, I want to be serious about this. I wasn't feeling particularly emotional at that time. But something had happened to me the night before, and I thought, I've got to follow him. Like Nat, he'd found me. He loved me. He'd held me. He knew me before I knew him. And I thought, I'm going to follow him. And you see, that's the call for us all today, whoever we are. And it doesn't matter whether you've been a Christian all your life or you've, whether you've just started. It doesn't matter whether you've had an experience 10 years ago and you can say, well, I became a Christian then. That doesn't really matter so much, actually. It's a part of me thinks I need to, I need to hear him every day. I need to be converted every day. I need to follow him every day. I need to have that experience, that epiphany every day so that I hear him saying, come get in. I loved you, I held you, I've known you, I've seen you. And despite it all, nothing will ever change my love for you. So come on, follow me. So join me in this great adventure. Let's pray together. Jesus, at the start of this year, 2021, it's an uncertain year, it's a frightening year, it's an unknown year for all of us. So much that we don't know, so much that we don't understand in a year of COVID. We're excited about these vaccines, but we're terrified, Lord, at these escalating, spiraling statistics. We're so mindful of doctors, nurses, key workers, health workers who are on their knees with exhaustion. And here we are, Lord, in this unknown year. We give ourselves to you. You're the king of the ages. You're the king of the universe. You're the king of time, the king of eternity. And so, Jesus, you've loved us. You've seen us. You've found us. You say, come, follow me. And today, you would say, yes, Jesus, I'm following you. Amen.